Yeah. Okay. And I also want to say, uh, you know, if you're new, like definitely let us know in the chat and uh, we can give you somebody to get in contact with to talk to one on one if you're curious about how to participate in DSA. Uh, yeah. So let's get started. Uh, I want to say welcome uh, from warm, beautiful, friendly Austin, Texas. My name is Heather and uh, we're going to talk about uh, the letter from Governor Abbott directing for trans healthcare for minors to be treated as child abuse. Uh, kind of the historical context and uh, how to respond to it as socialists. So there's a lot of like links and uh, links in the slide that will all be shared. Uh, I won't be able to cover everything, um, but I'll do my best. And I know people are angry about this and they want to know what they can do. So let's get to it. Right. Um, like I said, we'll talk about the letter and other recent events, other anti-trans state action uh, that's been recent, uh, where the GOP and the DNC both stand on this, uh, why the Republican Party uh, takes anti-trans discrimination as a strategy and what they get out of that, and a little bit about what we can do, some resources, and we'll also talk about strategy. So there's a lot of recent events to get through, so I'll try to move quickly. So. Just looking ahead, uh, we'll talk about uh, the immense wave of anti-trans bills that we had in 2021. Uh, the recent Ken Paxton, that's the Attorney General opinion, and then Governor Greg Abbott's letter, um, and how that actually has led to families with trans children being investigated by Child Protective Services. Um, there has been a little bit of a federal response to counter this, we'll see how effective it really is, but there is a response from uh, Health and Human Services and the Children's Bureau, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, but basically things are still kind of up in the air. There's been a ton of news since in between when I started on this presentation and now. I mean, there was even news that from yesterday that I added into it. Uh, so there will be recommendations for people to follow to continue following this story. Um, so on uh, like 2021, uh, there were, as of August 2021, there were 110 anti-trans bills that were introduced in the states, uh, which I think was triple or quadruple any year prior. So the categories on those were restricting health care for transgender youth, single sex facility restrictions, you know, like bathroom bills, like stuff is also going on excluding transgender youth from athletics. Now on trans people in sports, like I come down really strong on this. I think there's really nothing to lose from including trans people in sports and maybe uh, quite a bit to be gained. Um, the other categories were other school or curriculum restrictions, think like the anti-CRT stuff, but for gender identity, uh, there's been restrictions on accessing accurate ID uh, which means like being able to get a matching gender marker on your driver's license, your birth certificate, other stuff. And uh, like I'm not able to change my birth certificate. A lot of people aren't. Uh, in my home state of Georgia, they have a requirement that like you have to get bottom surgery, which a person might or might not want to get. So I would call that to be very polemic, the you have to cut your dick off policy. It's totally draconian. It's a total overreach of government. Um, so I just want to condemn that like in the strongest possible terms and, and the rest of it too. Um, there's other anti-trans bills that's stuff about school, school curricula and gender identity as a protected class. So it's a whole wave, right? We're really in a moment. It's not just one bigot. It's not just Greg Abbott. It's a whole trend, a whole tactic. So right ahead of the primary um, last week, the uh, Paxton opinion and the Abbott letter came out. Uh, we're actually gonna read the letter, but I just wanna say on the Paxton opinion really quick, there's something interesting to note where it cited uh, this UK civil rights case, Bell versus Tavistock, uh, which was like an anti-trans healthcare ruling that was then overturned by an appeal. And they cited like the pre-appeal version of it, uh, which just, shows something that like I think is really dangerous, which is this cross-pollination of anti-trans bigotry between the US and the UK and the rest of the world. 
Um, I think, you know, like things could definitely get worse in that regard. Um, so this is kind of like a concrete example of it. So there's a there's an important note like up talk to say about like how uh, like trans health illiterate uh, these opinions and rulings have been on like who gets surgeries and what the effects of puberty blockers are. Uh, so like I'm not trying to do like a real complete like trans health education presentation today, uh, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page about like what actually happens in reality. So like children don't get surgeries for like trans affirmation. Uh, there's like really rare cases where someone as young as like 16 but no younger who's been on hormones for a long time will get something like breast augmentation, uh, you know, after a lot of evaluation, of course. Um, and like the effects of puberty blockers are safe and reversible. Um, so like someone would be on puberty blockers for a time and then make the decision to like continue transitioning to the other sex and start HRT like at puberty age or uh, to uh, just stop taking puberty blockers and, and not transition and have a normal puberty. Um, so let's um, let's actually read the Abbott letter. I think a lot of people have seen this, but I want to make sure everybody has seen it. So uh, I'll just read this really quickly. Um, the Office of the Attorney General has now confirmed an enclosed opinion that a number of so-called sex change procedures constitute child abuse under existing Texas law. Because the Department of Family and Protective Services is responsible for protecting children from abuse, I hereby direct your agency to conduct, sorry, to conduct a prompt and thorough investigation of any reported instances of these abusive procedures in the state of Texas. It is already against the law to subject Texas children to a wide variety of elective procedures for gender transitioning, including reassignment surgeries that can cause sterilization, mastectomies, removals of otherwise healthy body parts, and administration of puberty blocking drugs or supraphysiologic doses of testosterone or estrogen. Texas law imposes reporting requirements upon all licensed professionals who have direct contact with children who may be subject to such abuse, including doctors, nurses, and teachers, and provides criminal penalties for failure to report such child abuse. Texas law also imposes a duty on DFPS to investigate the parents of a child who is subjected to these, uh, here they're saying, abusive gender transitioning procedures. Yeah, so really just despicable, like illiterate stuff. Um, and like this thing about requiring people to be reporters on this, there's like, uh, like we looked at um, SB8, which severely restricted access to abortions and allowed citizens to report. Uh, this letter is like a step beyond that because it's requiring reporting. So like as some people have said, like this is a political stunt, it's not gonna hold up and I, I got to give a little bit of pushback on that. Like, we don't know, like, really what's going to happen if this stuff is going to hold up, but this is already instilling terror and shock in trans children and their families, trans people at large. Uh, a lot of uh, families with trans children have been hiring and consulting lawyers proactively, and there are open investigations uh, for child abuse and, like, open court cases, like, for people, like, since this happened. There's at least a few cases. And uh, there was a state employee that was put on leave. Uh, a state employee of DFPS uh, wanted to ask, like, how is this being enforced? And does it apply to me since I have a trans child? That employee was put on leave. Uh, child Protective Services went to their house and, uh, and like, questioned the parents and the child separately. Um, and there's multiple cases of this so far. Right. Okay, I actually had a screenshot for that one. Um, I'll just read this real quick. The FPS has an active investigation open against my family, has, has already interrogated us in our home, and is now threatening to remove our kids from their loving family, the reason we are parents of a transgender child. Um, and then there's a couple of accounts from families of trans children that I want to read. Uh, Annalise Cuthren, San Antonio mother of a non-binary nine-year-old. 
We don't tell our kids what's happening, or if we do, we try to do it in a way that doesn't instill absolute terror because that's what we're feeling. And another similar one, um, Adeline is terrified she will be forcibly separated from her mother. So great is her anxiety that she doesn't want to sleep in her own bed. But this one, I wanna talk a little bit more about. Um, there's, um, there's 13 states uh, where from kindergarten through college, uh, trans people have been disallowed from participating in sports uh, like as their proper gender. Um, so Iowa just signed uh, into law uh, their bill on uh, anti-trans people and sports stuff. And uh, they did this photo op and I didn't wanna even put the picture in here because it's just so off-putting and weird, but uh, here she is, Kim Reynolds signing it. And they got like the whole room filled up with non-trans girls and moms. And they're all like standing around and smiling. And like this really teaches like the conservative strategy of uh, like creating an alleged like outsider predator character and then like protecting people from an imaginary threat and creating satisfaction around it. So there's a, there's a comparison you could make to like, between like white feminism and anti-trans feminism that I wanna quickly do a digression about. So like uh, white feminism holds up that like a certain type of woman, uh, white women are like the moral pillar of society, you know, like back uh, before civil rights, like there were white feminists who uh, said that like, it would be bad if black men could vote because that would make society worse. But if white women could vote, that would make society better because white women are so moral, like was the thrust of what they were saying. And in anti-trans feminism, it's a really like like one-to-one -one thing where it's like there's a certain type of woman who like needs protection and uh, like to be like uplifted in some kind of way. And like just this like anti-solidarity tactic uh, like, could be identified as being in common from you know years past to now. So um, on this story, there was uh, like a major provider of children's healthcare that called uh, Texas Children's Hospital. And uh, in Houston, they stopped providing hormone therapy to transgender children, this is just now, March 4th. Uh, after the governor directed the state's child welfare agency to open abuse investigations into parents to provide gender affirming care to their children. Uh, and there was a similar story last year in Dallas, uh, UT Southwestern um, closed down their uh, like gender affirming care um, because of direct outreach from the governor's office uh, to UT Southwestern. Uh, according to recordings of several phone discussions among hospital executives obtained by the New York Times. Um, and then last year, uh, when you know Texas was having its wave of anti-trans bills, um, there was a bill that like timed out. Um, actually, none of the, I'll describe this better later, but like none of the anti-trans bills were um, were voted no and like shut down that way they're all just like timed out so there was such a bill that had been timed out and then i'll just read it the only reason the trans kids and their families were first to return to the capital now was a democrat it was representative dutton so moving on there's a lot of stuff um right like i was saying um i'll just read it despite beating back the last of the biggest wave of anti-trans bills in any state in a single year. We never got to have a moment where trans lives were affirmed, Ada Rhodes said, because the bills were never rejected with a vote. It's not a good sign. Um, and like uh, what's happening now with the Abbott letter is we're waiting on a court ruling. And there's been some statements from the Texas state lawyer representing the, the Texas state um, saying, so the lawyer for the state uh, argued that the governor's letter has been misconstrued. This is, you know, like we just read the letter, we know that it says something quite different. 
So he says the opinion from the attorney general was intended to show not that gender affirming treatments are necessarily or per se abusive, but that these treatments like virtually any other implement could be used by somebody to harm a child, assistant attorney general Ryan Kircher said. So they're just saying, oh, we're not saying it is abuse. We're saying it could be. That's not what they said. And like the investigations are happening anyway. So that's, that's just the, the point I'm going to keep making. OK, uh, another one to take a little bit of a deeper look at. Um, this is just from yesterday. Uh, Idaho, Idaho's House passed a bill uh, that would make providing gender affirming care to trans minors a felony with a life sentence. Um, and it says that if you move your minor to another state and provide them health care there, that it's a felony too. Um, so certainly makes me worried about the future of trans people. Um, and I want to read like another part of this that's not highlighted where um, it's saying that there's exemptions about these kinds of surgeries being okay if we're talking about intersex children, right? So if you don't know, like there's more than two types of like phenotypes or kind of body shapes that people can be born into. Um, you know, there's a chance that when a person, it's like even more likely than being born with red hair would be having some kind of like non, um, it, it's called intersex. It means like, it's not, I'm not as up on the language about how to talk about it the right way, but like uh, it's exceedingly common for doctors to intervene and like try to reconstruct that baby's like body to more resemble like a, uh, male or female phenotype. Um, and that is explicitly exempted and allowed to continue because it's classified as like a good faith intervention. Uh, and that's in this bill and that's in like all the other stuff too. Okay, there's two more I didn't have slides for. Uh, like in Florida, like there's been a ton of attention around the don't say gay bill. It passed Congress, so it's just waiting for the governor's signature, and he's already signaled support for it. Um, it also affects trans topics. Uh, you won't be able to have a school teach anything about gender identity in kindergarten through third grade, uh, and I think that can be really important. Uh, and there's a real gap of like liberal animus and attention uh, between like don't say gay and all the anti-trans stuff, which like it's all serious. It's just like the, the anti-trans stuff has been kind of out of the spotlight. Um, and I also want to talk about this federal response from, you know, Health and Human Services in the Children's Bureau. You know, Biden said something like, you know, don't worry, we've got your back. And, you know, we'll see how that works out. I, you know, I'd love for it to, to work out right. Like, um, so the Health and, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Children's Bureau clarified that Healthcare providers are not to discriminate on gender identity. The guidance on patient privacy that healthcare providers are not required to disclose information about trans patients. So I'm really hoping that that holds up. I guess we'll see. And there's a lot of damage being done already anyway. So I really wanna push back against the idea that this stuff is just a political stunt and that it's like not gonna work. It's already working, okay. So this is a big one. Um, there's, there's Coke money, there's billionaire money being uh, funneled in to trigger anti-trans state action. So I'm going to read this section. As Brant Setter put it, it's all a part of the larger and more frightening project of legislating extremely strict gender roles in law, but it can be too hard to focus on that when engaged in the day-to-day -day struggle to combat anti-trans bill after anti-trans bill. You can see these goals laid out in Promise to America's Children, a shared policy agenda first reported on by Heron Greensmith at Political Research Associates in February 2021. The bills in Texas and across the country may trace their lineage directly to this promise, supported by the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Koch-funded Heritage Foundation, and the Family Policy Alliance, among other groups. The agenda laid out many of the same priorities as those found in the anti-trans bills, from preventing trans girls' participation in sports to outlawing puberty blockers, along with opposition to LGBTQ and women's rights to protect children, it promises, right? 
Okay, we'll get into like why this benefits conservatives a little bit more in a second. Um, so first, I'm, I want to play a clip that I think is really revealing where Bannon, Steve Bannon is in an um, interview with the American Policy Project or the APP president. Um, it's very revealing about how the right puts internal pressure on itself to discriminate more and more harshly, right? So like before the primary, like Abbott was having to like uh, make himself stand out as anti-trans enough uh, for him not to be challenged on that by somebody else within his party. Um, and we'll see here where somebody brags about being a part of making that happen and throwing money around to get it to happen. Uh, this was mentioned on the show a couple of weeks ago. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, what was going down in Texas. Walk us through what this thing is and what's Abbott doing. And I can't believe this bill didn't pass the legislature. I mean, I'm stunned and shocked by this. Walk us through what exactly has happened down there about this, whatever this situation is with these children. So this issue in Texas of you know, modifying children's sex and their gender has become such a big deal that it actually, the legislation to ban it got enough co-sponsors in both the House and the Senate in Texas to pass. But what happened was Abbott didn't want that to come to light. And so they used all of these backroom, uh, you know, legislative maneuvers to keep it from getting a vote. And we got together, we powered a campaign with the War Room. Another Steve, this is another victory for the War Room posse, right? Like this was... We put together a $750,000 uh, grassroots advocacy campaign with the war room support, and we put pressure on him right before the election. It wasn't a coincidence that he did this. And, and Abbott basically instructed all of his state agencies to treat this as child abuse, and, it, and it's now criminal to do this. Uh, it doesn't happen without two things. It doesn't happen without Ken Paxson and his leadership and, and what he came out with, and it also doesn't come without the support of the war room posse and what everything that they're doing to help us really make this pro-family movement more muscular. Okay, so, you know, like there he is just, you know, bragging about um, being able to like throw money around to get the stuff to happen, um, saying that, yeah, it takes cooperation uh, between like amongst the Republican party a little bit to make this happen, but they're all on the same page about it anyway. Um, and, yeah, he, he says, oh, we're making the pro-family movement more muscular. Yeah, no, it's it's anti-family, and we should be really clear on uh, the Republican Party's, like, anti-family, anti-freedom platform. Okay. Uh, so the U.S. right is attacking trans people. Uh, the base opposes, like, the voter base opposes having to witness the existence of trans people. Like, I think it was well stated what the Republican upset about uh, Colin Kaepernick was about was like, they don't want it on their screens. You know, like they don't want to see people whose values they disagree with and be made to look at it. And like, that's exactly why, like, if uh, uh, somebody is trans and they're doing sports and they have to be on the team that they don't want to be on and then they win, like they're still going to get booed by all the parents because they just don't want to have to look at what they don't want to look at. Um, so this is, it's all about creating excitement and, satisfa and satisfaction in the, in the base. It's a punishment-based process to, you know, allegedly protect the base from this alleged and imaginary threat. What they really care about is tax cuts for the rich and other anti-worker policies. You know, they don't really care about this which only highlights how much of a lowdown loser you have to be to go after kids. All right, um, I've got some more despicable like language I wanna read and then we can stop talking about the conservatives. Um, so one of Abbott's strategists, Dave Carney, uh, said in like a press conference that pushing anti-trans policy is a winner. So I wanna show, he said it was like a 75 to 80% winner um, and that this is proof that like Texans have good common sense. And uh, like, I don't know exactly where he's getting 75 to 80% from, but I wanna show an example of a Republican uh, poll, you know, like where if you go to the polls and you say you're Republican, then you get this, otherwise you wouldn't see it, um, where uh, they brought up 
trans healthcare for minors is an issue. And I'll show you the wording that they used. Texas should ban chemical castration, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and genital mutilation surgery on all minor children for transition purposes, given that Texas children as young as three are being transitioned from their biological sex to the opposite sex. So like, that's not happening. That's not reality. We're, there's not surgeries and like chemical castration given to three-year-olds, like does not happen. Um, like, so just to, just to give like the, the positive um, opposite of this is that like receiving trans healthcare when you're trans is immensely beneficial to the person who seeks it. And I'm not going to try to make that point too much because this that's just, you know, like, let's just, let's just take that on its face, I guess. So as like my last piece on this, uh, there's, there's all kinds of expressions of cissexism, cissexism in our society. It's soaked in, right? So there's media reporting, there's families that, you know, like there's endless media reporting on the, on the sports thing. Um, nothing else really gets the same level of attention. And there's, there's families that reject their trans members. There's alienating HR practices. And there's overrepresentation of trans people in poverty. And we can analyze how there's this like more explicit trigger of anti-trans state action and like Coke money, you know, billionaire money, um, funding policy projects for for that government action. So it's all a part of a larger conservative project of retaining power and control. We're all paying in, like we are all paying into society with our labor and we all deserve to benefit from it. We deserve a better society and a better government. And we'll talk about how to do that shortly. So I wanna talk about like where the Democratic Party stands in all of this. So the Democratic Party is not a proper opposition party. Uh, especially not on this issue. And I know I don't have to like remind people of their despicable history of by and large opposing marriage equality up until the last minute. So yeah, like the only reason that an anti-trans bill came back to the Congress floor in Texas last year was a fucking Democrat. You know, it's not just that they're inactive on this issue. You know, they don't even have like the internal discipline like not to pursue an anti-trans agenda. So is there a chance that the Democrats will create protections for trans people? I can't sit here and tell you that I know what's going to happen. The answer is perhaps, perhaps they will, perhaps not. You know, maybe they will decide to do trans protections because, you know, maybe they'll say, okay, there's not that many trans people in society. It's inexpensive and it looks good. Maybe they won't because they're in the habit of sitting it out and doing fundraising on the issues that they lose on, like abortion. Uh, so I want to share what, like one of my favorite characterizations of like the liberal like politician um, character and substance it's from Adolf Reed. When he described their propensity of aestheticizing other people's oppression and calling that activism, their reflex to their reflex to wring their hands and look constipated in the face of conflict. And most of all, their spinelessness and undependability in crises. So they're going to be reactive, not proactive. Legislation won't happen. We know like we can't get legislation through nationally. So it's going to be a struggle in the tangle of the court system. The recent federal response shows that this order to treat trans healthcare for minors as abuse is over the line. So we know that all the other stuff, the sports bans, are well within the bounds of what they will allow. So let's talk about like the historical context of how we got here and why we're in a world where this, where this strategy of the right works. So the failures of capitalism have opened up space for the right. Civic organizations have been hollowed out. The New Deal consensus has been undone. There's wage stagnation. There's a home affordability crisis. You take the fact that six out of 10 people in the US don't have $500 in the bank in case of an emergency. And like an aggregate statistic of all these things about how things are getting worse is that we're living in a time when life expectancy is actually going down. So 
it makes it that much easier for the right to promise a better life for its base at the expense of punishing some alleged outsider identity, identity category. When people fall for this, it is a moral failing. Sure, anti-trans bigotry is a moral failing, but we can't morally condemn our way to a better world. We have to make things real. So we're gonna take a look at some resources and strategy. Uh, and I just wanna express a little concern that like, all of this is just my personal recommendation for uh, people to follow. You know, I don't know if these people wanna be associated with the BSA, um, I wouldn't know. So uh, just for like following the stories of like uh, anti-trans state action and the heights of policy making, uh, definitely Chase Strangio at the American Civil Liberties Union and Jillian Brandstetter. These links are, these links are clickable, so I'll definitely make sure uh, to share the slides out for everybody to see, uh, get access to this stuff. Um, there's a, you know, there's very many like Texas and Austin specific uh, resources for trans people. Uh, the ones that I highlighted in green are things that you could donate to. And, you know, we can talk about the strategic, the what level of strategic importance doing donations has uh, in our discussion. Um, but I know, you know, it can't hurt. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not gonna go through these one by one, but I wanna highlight like the trans resistance of Texas, which has been like directing people to some of the protest actions. Um, there's TGQ meetup, which is like a casual, like social thing. That's, uh, it's a butterfly bar. I think it's really great. Uh, I think it's like, important to be able to find like other trans people in your city. And that's kind of the most accessible one. Um, as a Facebook group for the name and gender marker change and helping you get through all the hoops uh, to do that. So uh, yeah, definitely save these. Uh, you know, maybe somebody in your life will be in need of trans resources in the future, or uh, maybe you'll find that you yourself are trans, you know, crazier things have happened. It happened to me. so. Anyway, uh, we're getting to the end. Uh, I want to share like this article, uh, like a lot of the quotes that I took were from uh, Melissa Dira Grant's Behind the GOP Strategy to Outlaw Trans Youth. There's a listenable version of this article. Um, I really recommend it, it's 40 minutes. You can learn a lot about like the uh, really public like court cases about uh, alleging like trans affirmation is child abuse because you know it predates this year by quite a bit. Um, I've got all my links to the news stories and stuff. So as a final point, like let's get down to like strategy and like what we can do. Uh, and I think I'll put a little bit of a pin in this um, because it'll be more interesting when we can talk to each other uh, at the end of the presentation. I just wanna say like, remember nothing good is gonna come of anything unless we do the organizing to supplant power. I know like people want to feel like they're doing something. Um, when it comes to like testimony, like I've gone virtually to uh, some of the testimony against trans bills and it's, you know, it's really inspiring to see a bunch of people come out and say like, hey, I'm not just gonna take this, I wanna come and speak and defend myself. Uh, but it's so crushing just to see that get completely ignored because like it doesn't really matter to the people who are making the decision. Um, but I would encourage people to try to have that experience and try witnessing some of that testimony. Um, and like, I know DSA has gone as a group to like uh, testimony in the past, like on paid sick. And I think that we can look really good when we're all like articulate and like know our points. Uh, and we all say that we're from DSA, like that can be a, a worthy thing to send some people to do. And uh, anyway, we'll come back to this in discussion. Um, so socialists are the active members of the working class. We are united by sharing the cause of class struggle. And we're also united by our interest in something deeper. Uh, so is environmental justice attached to socialism? What about like provision of abortions? Like I think, that these connections aren't immediately obvious when we talk about class struggle. You know, there's justice for immigrants, there's indigenous issues. So how are these connections theorized between struggles across arenas and socialism? You know, ask yourself that. How do you theorize these connections? 
So to, to take like my stab at answering that, like I want to paraphrase a few of my inspirations. Um, like when Michael Brooks described the goal of creating like a legal and political body that assures house health care and safety to everybody so that we can go and live our own lives, which will be really different, but of which like we have nothing to say about, he described our cause as like the impulse of liberation at its root. Or uh, to paraphrase Cornell West, he was describing the revolutionary character of his outlook um, and like a tradition of truth telling and justice seeking in which the purpose of the truth is to allow suffering to speak. So all oppression is objectionable to socialists. As long as one person oppresses another, we can share a cause against it. The reason why the socialist theory of change is so strong is because capitalists need workers, us for our labor, and exercising worker power over capitalists is just a matter of how well we can organize. So people are angry about what's happening with anti-trans discrimination in Texas. Is there a political body that I can point people to that will create like a legal polity that assures safety and delivery of dignity? No, not yet. Creating that body is the task of the politically active section of the working class. So thanks everybody for listening. Uh, if you have feedback, uh, definitely let me know. Uh, send me an email or reach me some other way. Love to hear people's thoughts. Um, and of course, we've got the discussion coming up. Uh, so we'll get into it. 